Good morning. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. Today's program is brought to you by the Oklahoma Healthy Aging Initiative, or OHI, it is more commonly known. We are funded by the Donald W. Reynolds Foundation and operate within the Donald W. Reynolds Department of Geriatric Medicine at the University of Oklahoma Health Science Initiative Center. Uh, OHI is a statewide organization devoted to the health of older adults. We teach classes for older adults and their caregivers, provide family and professional caregiver training. We partner with health systems across the state to provide specialized geriatric care. And we work with local leaders to promote the interest of older adults. Today, we are very excited to have with us Senator Irvin Yin. He was elected to the state Senate in 2014 and is the only physician serving in the upper chamber and the first Asian American elected to the legislature. Dr. Yen, or Senator Yen, was born in Taipei, Taiwan in 1954. Senator Yen's family immigrated to America and in 1960 moved to Oklahoma City, which has been his home ever since. Along with his parents and siblings, Yen became a naturalized citizen at the age of nine. In 1977, he earned a zoology degree from the University of Oklahoma and then his MD from the OU College of Medicine. Dr. Yen has been a cardiac anesthesiologist for over 20 years. This year, he's led some very important efforts. One of those is to require vaccinations for all children entering public schools, with the exception of a medical exam exemption. In 2015, Senator Yen championed Oklahoma's new law banning texting while driving and was named Legislature, Legislator of the Year by the Oklahoma Academy of Family Physicians. Married for over 28 years, Irvin and Pam Yen have five children and are members of Christ the King Catholic Church. So Senator Yen, thank you for being here. We are very happy and honored to have such a strong public health advocate. Um, you are welcome to keep your microphones on. Senator Yoon welcomes your questions and he will be happy to lead any discussion you would like. So please uh, feel free to interact. And thank you for joining us. You're welcome. Very nice to it's have you. It's an honor I'll to turn be it here. over to you. To here. And uh, my, my bio, I'll have to give some details. I, actually, this year, my Pam and I celebrated our 30th wedding anniversary. And my wife tells me that's a big deal. Um, uh, Unfortunately, we, uh, that's already occurred, and I couldn't get off a week to go on a little trip, but, but we will be doing that soon, that's hopefully. Uh, but OHI is, uh, I'm honored they asked me to do this uh, as the only physician currently in the Senate. I don't know who else you would ask, but anyway, yeah. It's, <laughs> I, 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 I'm very happy to do this. Uh, but also, OHI, you know, uh, deals with issues that affect 60-year-olds and older, and that would be me. Okay, so I've been asked to uh, talk about immunizations, but I, I, I'd love to just kind of talk about health in general for uh, older Oklahomans. Uh, and, um, uh, and, and also, I need to start out by saying that I'm an anesthesiologist, okay? I'm not a gerontologist. I'm, I'm, I'm not a primary care doctor. And so uh, I do know a lot about vaccinations because of my bill or bills. And so uh, you need to talk to your primary care physician about your specifics. You know, I'll give you generalities, but, uh, and I'm happy to do that. Um, but uh, I'll, I'll start first by talking about my vaccination bill. Currently in Oklahoma, you, you have to vaccinate your children if you want to send them to any kind of school private, public, or parochial, the, the law specifically says. Uh, and uh, however, you can be exempted from vaccinations, your children can, for medical reasons. And to get that exemption, you have to get a physician's signature, okay? But also, you can be exempted for any reason you want with a parental signature, okay? That means any reason or no reason, okay? And so what I'm trying to do is to get rid of all exemptions to vaccinations except the medical, okay? Because there certainly are some reasons not to be vaccinated, certainly some medical reasons. But in my mind, there's no other reasons, okay? Uh, a lot of folks talk about religious exemptions. 
I don't know what a religious exemption is to vaccination, okay? And, I, and I've asked anti-vaccination people that question. What is a religious objection to a vaccination? And they can't tell me, okay? Maybe someone can, but so far nobody's told me, okay? And I don't know what it is. All right, so what has happened with my bill? Well, basically nothing, okay? I cannot get the other legislators to agree with me. Now, why is that? Well, two reasons. One, the anti-vaccination people are very vocal and they're pretty well organized and they show up at the Capitol to talk to the legislators. And in my opinion, they give the legislators kind of a skewed opinion on vaccinations because the pro-vaccination people don't show up at the Capitol. It's just the anti-vaccination people that show up. But I believe the vast majority of Oklahomans agree with my bill. In fact, we've done a couple of polls that show that. In fact, uh, 67 to 72 percent of Oklahomans agree with my bill that takes away all exemptions except the medical. So I will keep working on that. Hopefully we will get it done. I, I, actually, I'm certain that we will get it done sooner or later, but I'd like to get it done sooner before we have a, an outbreak of some disease. And, and this is very important, especially for seniors. Um, Last year, in the state of Oklahoma, the health department tells me that there were 86 cases of whooping cough, also known as pertussis. Pertussis just means coughing. Uh, and this year, already in six months, there were, you're coughing, you don't have pertussis yet. <laughs> uh, uh, this year already, there's been 70 cases, okay? Why has that happened? Well, in my opinion, it's the anti-vaccination movement, okay? The anti-vaccination movement occurred in other states earlier than it did in Oklahoma, like everything, okay? And it occurred in California years ago, and so their vaccination rates went down. For measles, mumps, rubella, it went down to 90%. And then they had the outbreak from Disneyland, okay, last year, I think it was early last year. And so the California legislature passed a bill just like the one I'm trying to get passed, okay? That law is going into effect now for the fall term, okay? It, it, it didn't go into effect until school started, and I guess school started out there like it has here. But already, their measles, mumps, rubella vaccination rate has gone from 90 to 93% already. Now, you know, you can't say that's specifically that law, probably more, it's, it's more so the <laughs> outbreak from Disneyland. You know, a lot of people, well, several years ago, I think about four years ago, there was an outbreak of measles in an Amish community in Ohio, okay? Like 180 something people got measles. And, and normally, if you look at the last 10, 15 years, the number of people that get measles in the, America is around 40, 50, maybe 60 cases. But that year, in one community in Ohio, 180 something. Now, from what I can tell, I don't believe anybody died, but eight people were hospitalized. Okay, measles, yeah, people say, ah, what's the big deal about measles? Well, measles can cause encephalitis. What is encephalitis? That's inflammation of your brain. I don't know about you all, but I don't want inflammation of my brain. So that, that's not a good thing. So. What do you think is cheaper, vaccinating 187 people or hospitalizing eight people? It, in, in my opinion, immunizations and vaccinations are a no-brainer, okay? And virtually every physician that I know will say the same thing. I'm sure you can find a physician that disagrees with my bill, okay? But it will be very difficult to find that physician. Every, all the physicians I've talked to absolutely agree with my bill. And, and they always ask me, well, why don't the legislators pass it? And it's because they get this skewed vision from their constituents. And a bunch of these legislators are, you know, anti-big government. And they believe mandating vaccines is big government, okay? I don't agree with that. Mandating vaccinations is about public safety. It's about protecting the, that immune-compromised child 
when that child goes to school so they are not exposed to a highly contagious disease that could kill them, that could kill them. Now, I'm not worried about my family. Thank God none of my kids are immune compromised and they're all vaccinated, okay? It's not about my family. It's about families that have somebody that's immune compromised. That's who it's about. And, and I had one person tell me that this, she said that, you know, she didn't have any kids. She said, you know, if you have a child that's immune compromised, that child should stay at home. I disagree with that. I disagree with that. That child should be able to go to school with other kids if the vaccination rate is high enough. And currently, like I said, in Oklahoma, or maybe I didn't say, we're only at 90% like California. We used to be 95%. We're going the wrong direction. So if we were at 95%, I wouldn't even be talking about this immunization bill because that would be high enough. Because the experts tell you for herd immunity, you need 93, 94% vaccination rate. What is herd immunity? That means, let's say you got a class of 20 kids. One of those kids cannot be vaccinated because they're immune compromised or they're allergic to something. Well, that child won't get the disease because the other 19 kids are vaccinated. That's herd immunity, okay? Now, before, I, actually about a year ago, I was going out of the country and uh, I decided that I should get uh, my tetanus shot because I hadn't had one in at least 10 years. <laughs> so I go to get my tetanus shot. Well, lo and behold, I discovered that I needed something called a Tdap, okay? Which is tetanus, <coughs> diphtheria, uh, and pertussis. I went, I didn't know that. And so that's what I got. Okay, and pertussis or whooping cough is very important for adults and seniors because you might go visit that newborn grandbaby, okay? Pertussis or whooping cough causes inflammation of your windpipe, okay? Now, if any of us adults in this room got pertussis, you might think you got a cold or something, maybe a cold that lasted a long time. You'd cough. Your windpipe might swell by a millimeter, maybe two millimeters. Probably wouldn't be a big deal. But in a baby, it can be a big deal because the size of your windpipe as an adult is about as big as my, your little finger, okay? A baby's windpipe is about the size of a small straw and one to two millimeters of swelling in their windpipe can kill them, okay? And as a matter of fact, if either, either three or four years ago, a two-month-old baby in Elk City died of whooping cough. That's, that's nuts, that's insane. We should not have any cases of whooping cough, let alone a baby dying, okay? Let me tell you about whooping cough. In 1976, in the entire country, there were only a little over a thousand documented cases. That's 1976. You go to 2012, there were nearly 50,000 cases. That's the wrong direction. And that, that's documented. I'm sure there are more than that, but documented a little over 50,000 cases. Why did that happen? Or really two reasons. But the primary reason, in my opinion, is the anti-vaccination movement, okay? But also, over the years, they have changed the pertussis vaccination because of side effects, they changed it. In fact, they used to use live virus, now they don't. And so it's probably not as effective as it used to be. And I think probably what will happen is they're gonna decide that for the whooping cough vaccine, you need to get a booster shot every five, maybe 10 years. So there's nothing, you know, it's just not as effective. There's nothing wrong with the vaccine. It probably just needs to be given every so often, okay? So we'll talk about vaccinations for, for uh, older folks. And uh, again, I'm an anesthesiologist 
And so I <laughs> started reading about vaccinations for older folks. And lo and behold, on, on one of these pieces of paper, it says that, well, we'll talk about this here in a second, but when you're 50, you're supposed to get the meningitis vaccine. And I went, I'm over 50, I haven't gotten that. So I ran out and got that a few weeks ago. But so I, I think the healthcare, medicine, doctors, have not done a very good job of educating our, our older folks about the vaccinations that they need. So, help, so hopefully me talking about this will help some of the older folks. Um, I'll start out by saying that there was a study a few months ago. They looked at elderly, elderly folks in uh, nursing homes because that, that's an easy group to study because they're all in one place. You know, it's, it's, it's harder to study all elderly folks, but there's no question that immunization in nursing home populations is, is, you know, decreases morbidity and mortality without question. And uh, we'll talk about the specifics here, uh, but the flu vaccine, okay? Everybody needs that, including elderly folks, everybody. Uh, now, th there are some contraindications to some of the vaccinations that we'll talk about today. And for the flu shot, uh, if you're allergic to eggs, it's not good because it's made from something from eggs. Uh, also, if you've had Guillain-Barre, and that's a word that a lot of us don't understand, but if you've got Guillain-Barre, you know what that is. Uh, and the other thing is, if you have a fever, they will tell you that uh, to wait until you don't have a fever to get your shot. And remember, as you've probably read in the news, the flu vaccine varies in its effectiveness because every year when they make the flu vaccine, they're trying to guess as to what the, the strains of flu are or will be in the coming year. And so sometimes they don't get it right. Now it turns out that uh, this past year it was very effective, but the year before it was not. Does that, does that mean you shouldn't get it? No, no, absolutely. You should get the flu shot, okay? Absolutely. Um, and the, usually they're given between September and March. I personally get mine about October. And uh, there's been some recent talk about the nasal flu uh, vaccine, which uses live, uh, vac live virus. And uh, there's some studies that are showing that perhaps that's not quite as effective as the shot. So um, older folks should probably get the shot instead of the, the nasal form. Uh, and then, okay, tetanus, diphtheria, and pertussis like we talked about. Again, that's something that everybody needs. If you've never had a pertussis shot, you need one, okay? Um, and every 10 years, you need the tetanus and diphtheria, okay? If you've not had those within 10, ten years, go get those. And if you've, if you've discovered that uh, you've never had a pertussis shot, you'll get all three. Okay, all right. Um, so that's everyone. Now, let's see. Um, as I talked about, it, the, the uh, pertussis shot is uh, real important for people who have close contact with infants that are younger than 12, years of, 12 months old. Because uh, infants, uh, they're too young to be vaccinated for pertussis. Actually, uh, and a lot of people don't realize why that is, and I didn't until recently. Uh, I thought that they didn't vaccinate newborns because it might be dangerous for them. Well, that's not the case. What it is is the newborn inherits antibodies from the mother. And if you try to vaccinate them, it, it doesn't, they don't get immune because the antibodies that the newborn has interferes with the, the uh, immunization. So yeah, so that's why they got to wait a few months before they start uh, immunizations. Except for one of the hepatitis vaccinations. They give that to, to all babies when they are leaving the hospital, even premature babies. And you will hear the anti-vaccination people say that it's never right to inject these poisons into a newborn or, or a preemie. Well, okay. If you look at the list of ingredients in these vaccines, there's all kinds of stuff in them, okay? But thankfully, they're at minuscule quantities. Just like if you look at the ingredients 
in the water that you drink at home, there's going to be stuff in it. In fact, I got a report from my water company that said there's arsenic in the water that's slightly, slightly above what it ought to be. Okay? Am I worried about that? Uh, no. I mean, if it goes up more, yeah, then I'd worry about that. But again, if you read the ingredients in, in anything that you ingest, there's, there's some bad things, okay? But thankfully, they're in minuscule quantities. And these anti-vaccination people will frequently blame vaccines for all kinds of diseases. Why does that happen? Well, let's say you have a child, and this child gets some god-awful disease. Well, that child probably, prior to you discovering this god-awful disease, got a vaccination. Because we give kids, normally, if you're not an anti-vaccination person, we give our kids vaccinations frequently between the age of, you know, when they're born and, and 12 years old. So it's easy to blame vaccinations when a disease shows up, okay? But it's like one of the other doctors <laughs> that I worked with yesterday. He said, yeah, well, you can blame uh, eating breakfast. So j j just because something B happens shortly after A, that doesn't mean there's a cause effect that's worth looking at. And in fact, I recently read that in communities that spray for mosquitoes from airplanes aerially, those communities have a 25% higher incidence of autism. Okay? Does that mean that the, the spraying is causing it? No, but it's it's something you should look at. And speaking of autism, there are zero studies that show any relationship of autism and vaccinations. Okay, there are none. Years ago there was one, but that's been debunked. In fact, it was fraudulent. The author of that study lost his medical license in England over it. Okay? And someone recently sent me an article from Australia where they looked at like 11 different worldwide studies on vaccinations and autism. And actually, one of these studies did show a correlation between autism and vaccination. And it was that in the group of people that got MMR, measles, mumps, rubella vaccination, incidence of autism was lower. Okay? So the anti-vaccination people need to stop talking about autism. They're still doing it, though, unfortunately. Okay, uh, the, if you have a history of epilepsy, you need to talk to your doctor uh, before you get the, the Tdap. Um, also, if you've had uh, Guillain-Barre again, you need to talk to your doctor about that. Also, if you've had uh, severe swelling or pain after a prior dose of Tdap or TD, uh, tetanus diphtheria. You need to talk to your doctor about that. So remember, every, every 10 years you need uh, tetanus and diphtheria and uh, one time you need pertussis. Okay, shingles or herpes zoster. I, I would recommend that if you are over 50, okay? But an important thing to remember is that uh, most insurances will not pay for that until you're 60. Um, I got mine recently, um, and, and <laughs> shingles, I, I, I'm a bit unusual because I got shingles when I was four years old. It's very, very rare in children, and yeah, it's terrible. It's terrible, and, and even if you've had shingles, you still need to get the shingles vaccination. Uh, and for those of you who don't know what shingles is, uh, you, you probably know somebody who's had it. It's a very, it's painful, blistering skin rash, and it's caused by the varicella, varicella zoster virus. Um, and, and varicella is chicken pox, I'm sure a lot of you know. Um, and uh, the CDC recommends that everybody over 60 get vaccinated because actually more than 99% of Americans over the age of 40 have had chicken pox. You, you may not remember it, but, but chances are you've had chicken pox. Uh, so um, don't get the shingles vaccine if you've got a weak immune system like uh, AIDS or HIV. 
uh, if you're being treated with drugs that uh, compromise your immune system, uh, including such medicines as steroids, uh, or if you're on uh, chemotherapy or radiation therapy, uh, or you've had a history of cancer affecting the bone marrow or the lymphatic system, such as leukemia or lymphoma. Okay. Um, now, interestingly, uh, you probably should not have the shingles vaccine if you are allergic to gelatin, like what you make jello with. Um, now, I've been in practice since 1984, and I don't believe I've ever had a patient allergic to gelatin, so the chance of that's probably pretty small. Uh, now, however, another important thing is uh, if you're allergic to neomycin, you should not have the shingles vaccine. And neomycin is an antibiotic that's frequently used. In fact, it's used on the, on the creams that you might put on a, on a wound. But so that's important. If you're allergic to neomycin, you should not have the shingles vaccine. And I will say, since 1984, I've probably had several patients that were allergic to neomycin. So something to remember. Okay, uh, MMR, measles, mumps, rubella, that vaccine, if you were born after 1956, uh, you're supposed to have that. Now, most of the people listening to this are born before 1956, myself included, I'm sure. And that's because the measles vaccine started in 1957. And uh, you should not get this vaccine, uh, again, if you're allergic to gelatin or neomycin or to a previous dose of MMR, measles, mumps, rubella. Um, again, if you are moderately or severely ill, you need to postpone the vaccination uh, with MMR. Uh, if, you're, uh, if you are or might be pregnant, uh, you should hold off. Talk to your doctor about it, your uh, OBGYN. Uh, and this says that women should avoid getting pregnant for four weeks after getting the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine. And again, if you uh, have AIDS or another disease that compromises your immune system, you should not have the measles, mumps, or rubella. Um, also, if you're being treated with drugs that compromise your immune system, any kind of cancer, uh, if you're being treated with uh, chemotherapy or radiation therapy, if you've got a low platelet count, uh, if you've had, recently had a transfusion or were given other blood products, and I don't know the reason for that one anyway. Okay, hepatitis A vaccine. Uh, adults uh, 50 and older that engage in certain behaviors should have that one, okay? Uh, including same-sex male intercourse, illicit injectable drug use. Um, those people are at higher risk of contracting hepatitis A and they should be vaccinated. Um, it's, it's spread through close contact. Um, so it's also recommended for people with chronic liver disease uh, if you have close contact with somebody that has hepatitis A, you should also probably be vaccinated. Or if you're traveling to an area that has a lot of hepatitis A. And uh, it's given uh, once for, for, for babies, but uh, there's two dos doses over 18 months if you're uh, uh, over, if you're older. Um, and another important thing is, for the, the people listening, if you or anybody close to you is adopting a child from a country with a high rate of hepatitis A, you should get vaccinated for that. Okay, hepatitis B. Um, again, if you're 50 or older and are at risk for certain, uh, for hepatitis B, that would include having sex with partners who are infected with hepatitis B, uh, a man who has sex with other men, if you have more than one sex partner, if you inject straight drugs, if you have chronic liver or kidney disease, if you're uh, under 60 and have diabetes, if you have a job that exposes you to human blood or other body fluids, uh, again, if you live uh, with people or in contact with people that have hepatitis B, um, or if you work or live with the developmentally disabled, if you're on kidney dialysis, again, if you're traveling to a country that has a lot of hepatitis B, uh, and if you have HIV infection, you should get the hepatitis B vaccine. And that, uh, that's given in three doses, with the second dose given four weeks after the first, and the third dose uh, five months after the second. But again, you don't have to remember that. Your healthcare provider would, would know all that. 
Um, if you're unsure about your hepatitis B, B vaccination status, then just get a booster. Do not get the hepatitis B if you've got a life-threatening allergy to uh, yeast or anything that's in the hepatitis uh, B vaccination, uh, or if you've had a life-threatening allergic reaction to uh, the hepatitis B vaccine. That's on this piece of paper, but if, you, if that's happened to you, why would you go get another one? Right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and uh, again, if you're moderately or severely ill, wait till you're not to go get the hepatitis B. Okay, meningitis, that's the one that I just recently got. And if you are uh, 50 and older, you should have that if you've never had it. Um, and um, people are at increased risk for meningitis if you live in a college dorm. Probably none of the <laughs> viewers live in a college dorm. Uh, if you work in a laboratory in which you're routinely exposed to the uh, meningitis bacteria, if you're in the US military, uh, if you're traveling to parts of the world where meningitis is common, such as Africa, if you've got a damaged spleen or your spleen's been removed, uh, if you've got uh, persistent complement component deficiency, that's an immune system disorder, uh, and uh, if you uh, have or may have been exposed to meningitis during, during an outbreak, so you need that. Okay, and it so happens that uh, if you're 50 to 55, there's one kind of meningitis vaccine you're supposed to have, but if you're older than 55, there's a different one. But again, your healthcare provider would know that, and, and the pharmacist knows that as well. Uh, okay, and then uh, the last on my list is the uh, pneumonia vaccine, okay? Everyone 65 or older needs the pneumonia vaccine, and then people over 50 with certain risk factors. So talk to your doctor about that. Um, but uh, let's see. It's real important that you get this, especially if, you've, if you're a smoker or you have serious health problems like uh, chronic lung or heart disease diabetes, asthma, leukemia, lymphoma, or alcoholism. And uh, if you work around chronically ill people, uh, then you should get this as well, okay? So that's a, a very brief summary of uh, immunizations for uh, folks really over 60, okay? Um, now, can I, questions? Anybody have any questions? Hopefully, hopefully I'll hear you. She's getting ready to talk here. Hi, um, this is Erin from Pocket City. Ah, good. I have a few questions for you. Shoot. <laughs> if that's okay. Okay, um, I just had a baby, so a lot of things are concerned with just being a new mom for me. Sure. I was wondering on the, because I did not get, and I don't know of my history of pertussis, but I have an infant at home. Would it be safe to go ahead and get that vaccination now, or should I wait till she's out of the one year phase. No, it, 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 I think it would be safe because the pertussis vaccination now is not live virus. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, my other question is with MMR, if uh -huh. I've had it before, do you need a booster on that or is that just a one-time vaccination? Uh, you know, let me see here. MMR. I think that's one time, but ask your health care provider just to make sure, okay. yeah. Yeah. I, I have one more question. <laughs> yeah, I think that's just one time. Yeah, sure, sure, shoot. Sure. Um, my other question was about your opinion on fairly new vaccinations. HPV? Um, that, well, which one is that one? HPV, human papillomavirus. Yes, like I know I was offered that um, a few years back when I was at the very end of the age group for it, and I was right. kind of nervous to get it because it had only been out a couple of years. Yeah. Sometimes I think back to that, and I was just wondering what your opinion was if, you know, faced with a situation like that again, do right, you think it's safe to let, go ahead and take it uh, Yeah. Or? Let me tell you some statistics about HPV, human papillomavirus. It's, uh, it's rampant, okay? The virus is rampant. In fact, I've had doctors tell me that they believe that in America, if you're having sex with someone that's had sex with somebody else, you've got HPV or you've had HPV. It's that rampant, okay? Some of my obstetrician buddies tell me that, well, maybe it's not that bad, but it may be 90%, okay? So the point is, if you're having sex with some, somebody that's had sex with somebody else, chances are you're, get, you're gonna get it. So, Absolutely, you should get the HPV vaccination. Now, 
HPV can lead to cervical cancer, okay? We know that. In women, of course, because men don't have a cervix. But it can also lead to throat cancer, which men can get. And I read a frightening statistic just about two weeks ago. And that is they say that, I, I can't remember what year this was, but the last year they have statistics for, which was either 15, maybe 14, they said that the incidence of cancers in America caused by HPV went up 17% in one year, 17%. So yes, get the HPV vaccine. And I think they started in children at maybe 11 or 12, maybe 13 years of age. And of course people go, my kids are not having sex. What do they need that for? Well, it's like all immunizations. You get the immunization to protect you in the future, okay? And the vast majority of people in this country ultimately will have sex. That's why you need to get the HPV vaccine because HPV is rampant. So were you asking about any other immunizations besides HPV, you said newer. Well, that was one I was thinking of. Yeah, I'm sure it was, know, yeah. You know, I'm sure they'll come out with new ones. I just didn't know yeah, what right, right, was on right. new. Yeah, right, right, right. You know what the age cutoff is for the HPV vaccination? Uh, yeah, like yeah, there, there is an age cutoff. Um, but again, I, I, I suppose if you're married and you only have one sex partner, then maybe you don't need to have it. But if you're unmarried and might have sex partners in the future, I'd go get, I'd go get it even if you're over 25. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you. And, and also, if uh, there's a great Nova episode mm -hmm. that's about 45 minutes long on vaccinations. It's really cool to watch if you have time um, because Oklahoma City is prominent in it because they interview a pediatrician, I believe, or maybe OBGYN, at OU, at the medical center, uh, who talks about HPV, uh, about the vaccine. But she, uh, they also interview a woman in Northwest Oklahoma City that had a daughter die at 36 years of age from cervical cancer. That's, that's a great, great NOVA episode. And the episode starts out by talking about, uh, with a couple that had a child that got vaccinated and then shortly after had a seizure, okay? So this couple were anti-vaccination. They thought the vaccination caused this child's seizure, okay? Well, they later found out that their child had a rare genetic disorder called Dravet syndrome, or D it's D-R-A-V-E-T, okay? So I guarantee you that vaccine did not cause the child's Dravet syndrome because that's a genetic disease. That kid was born with it. Okay. Now, it's certainly possible that the vaccination of the child triggered the first seizure, okay? Because what's one of the side effects of, a vac of lots of vaccinations? A fever, okay? And fever can sometimes lead to a seizure. In fact, there are children that have a fever and then a seizure and then the rest of their life, they never ever have another seizure. And so those are febrile seizures, okay? So again, the vaccine did not cause the, the, the disease, but it might have triggered that very first seizure. Now, if you've already been exposed to something and you get the vaccine, will it kind of keep it from progressing, do you think, or does it have- Well, well, I, I, I would, well that's like sometimes when they have outbreaks, in, in, in mm -hmm. different places that they, they go in and vaccinate everybody. So yeah, if you're around an outbreak, absolutely still go get vaccinated. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Now hopefully we, hopefully we won't have outbreaks. That's what I'm working on, I guess, but okay. Any other questions about immunizations? Actually, mine is similar to hers with the outbreak question. I have a stepmother with hepatitis C and I know uh -huh. that this is an epidemic with baby boomers. She's in that cohort, um, you know, we don't really need to take too many precautions. We haven't had any incident where she's cut herself or anything. Is there anything that can be done about that particular Ooh. situation or is that something that's in the works? You know, I don't know, I don't, I don't okay. know the answer to that. Yeah, I do not know the answer to that. Wow. So how old? 58. 58. Any idea how got? No, I just know that there's a huge 
chunk of people in that generation yeah. who may have it. So we, you know, I urge all my in-laws, you need to go to your PCP and get a blood test for this. My yeah. father got tested for it. He's fine. Yeah. But just curious if you've heard of anything where the people are working on a hepatitis C vaccine. Well, I'm sure they are. I would yeah, imagine, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm sure they are. Uh, but yeah, but in interestingly, um, you know, this Zika has a lot of people freaked out, okay? And, and well, it should. Although I've, I've read where some people think we will, in America, we won't, it won't be anything like in Brazil because we live and work in air conditioned surroundings. Whereas in like Brazil, people open the windows and mosquitoes fly in, okay? Uh, this was about 10 days ago I read that in Florida so far at that point in time they'd had 28 cases of Zika in Florida that, that they believe were transmitted by a mosquito bite. Okay? So there's no question it's on the way here so we need to take some precautions you know try not to get bit by mosquitoes which of course sometimes is difficult to do but I have a way to do that at least at your house. Okay. At my house, I've had a mosquito problem for many, many years. I've lived in my house since 1989. And I've tried everything for mosquitoes, okay? And I've discovered over the years there are two things that work for mosquitoes. One is a fogger, okay? It spews out this, this it's really a gas. And it will work for a few hours, okay? But, but that's it. But there's another product that I started using five or ten years ago that's unbelievable. Write this down. Cutter, C-U-T-T-E-R. They, they make the stuff that you slather on when you go camping, okay? Well, they make a product called Backyard Bug Control, okay? Backyard Bug Control. It comes in a gray bottle. It hooks up to your water hose, mixes, and then you spray it, okay? So I spray it in my backyard. We're, we're seldom in my front yard, so I don't spray it in the front yard. But in my backyard, I spray where, I don't spray all the grass. I spray where the grass meets the building or a fence. And I spray shrubs, bushes, the trunks of trees, and low-hanging branches of trees. And if you have anything that collects water, spray it in there. And you might even spray it up on your guttering, okay? This stuff works for weeks to months, okay? I've been using it for five or 10 years. And I think it's, it's working longer and longer. I think the longer I've used it, the longer it, it lasts. Because what I do every year is in the spring, I tell the, the family, tell me when you see a mosquito. And when they do, I spray. And then I say, tell me when you see another mosquito. And when that happens, I spray again. It used to be I'd go to my backyard for 10 minutes and get five or 10 mosquito bites. I get none now. It's amazing. Now be careful because Cutter recently came out with another, another product called Backyard Bug Control and it's an aerosol can and I know nothing about that, okay? But the Backyard Bug Control that hooks up to your water hose, it works. It's about 10 bucks. You can get it at Home Depot, Lowe's, uh, Walmart. And I will say that the price over the last year has gone up about $2, probably because of Zika but it works, okay? And I saw where in Florida, where they have these cases for mosquitoes that they've been spraying with, for mosquitoes, and um, they use a gas, it looks like to me, a fogger. And initially I read where they were not having much success controlling the mosquito population. They, they thought that maybe mosquitoes had somehow adapted to this, this, this fogger, but I went, why aren't they using this cutter stuff? Maybe they don't know about it, but anyway, everybody needs to know about this cutter stuff, okay? Uh, it, it, it works and it doesn't hurt, I, I don't have any dogs, but my wife has three dogs. It doesn't hurt them, it doesn't hurt the plants at all, okay? Go buy it today. It'll take you 15 minutes to spray. Cutter, backyard, bug control. All right, other questions? <laughs> I have one, quick, one question about pneumonia. Yeah. How often should you receive that injection? Oh, uh, you know, I think that's a one-time shot. Yeah, I believe that's a one-time shot. But again, ask your primary care provider, okay? Okay, and then one more question, if I may. When you were talking about the tetanus, uh -huh. I had a little um, accident this summer and went to the emergency room and I was given a tetanus shot. Uh -huh. Am I to assume that was the combination shot? 
Ooh, you, you, I would contact the, the hospital where you okay. went to see. Okay, I was in yeah. another state. I was on vacations. Yeah, uh, I, yeah. I guess I can still find out. Yeah, okay. yeah. I, I would bet they would be able to tell you. Yeah. Okay. But, so yeah, All you, right. yeah. If you if, again, if you've not had pertussis vaccination, yeah, you need that, and you also need diphtheria if, you, if, even, if you're not. Even yeah. if I've had a single tetanus shot, correct? Right. I should it, still it, have right. that combination. Okay. It, well, yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Okay. Right. Other questions? Okay, now, if there are no other questions, feel free to ask anything that I might know the answer to. Okay, let's talk about just kind of health in general, okay? You know, I told you uh, that when I was four years old, I had uh, shingles. And, and, you know, some people think that uh, getting shingles is maybe related to stress. And so I go, well, yeah, that very well may be, because what happened when I was four years old? I moved from Taiwan to Oklahoma City. And uh, that was pretty stressful, pretty stressful. Not nearly as stressful as, as it was probably on my parents. I mean, I, I can't, can you imagine leaving a good job? My parents had two good jobs, leaving friends, family, to go to this place where People look different, talk different, wear clothes that are different, eat different, probably smell different. But by golly, my parents did that. And why do they do that? I, they did that for their kids. And, and actually, it's kind of an interesting story. My, my parents were from the China mainland, okay? So I'm not Taiwanese, I'm Chinese, but born in Taiwan. And my parents were lucky enough to have left mainland China before the communists took over in 1949. And my mother worked at the weather station in Taipei, the capital. My dad worked for the railroad system in Taiwan. And they both came from capitalist families. In fact, my uncle, who I've never met, my, my mother's only brother, he was the director of the weather station in Taipei. But also, at some point in the 40s, he was the mayor of the second big, biggest city in, in Taiwan, which I don't know the name of that. Plus, I couldn't say it if I did uh, properly. Uh, but unfortunately, he moved back to mainland China before 1949 when the communists took over. And so I think he went back primarily to run the family business which was a store that sold art supplies and writing utensils. He got put in prison by the communists when they took over and they confiscated the family store. He was in prison for years, subsequently released, but then for some reason they put him back in prison months or years later. And the story is that he was released again and the vehicle that was carrying him away from the prison had an accident, he was killed. Okay, so that's the story. And my parents really did not know that story until the 70s because there was really no communications between the West and mainland China because they're communists. And it was only when Nixon visited China and started opening relations that my parents found out the specifics of that story. Anyway, so my parents, both from capitalist families, they thought the communists would come take over Taiwan or Formosa is what it was known back then. So, when I was two years old, my family decided they were going to come to America. So my dad left my mother with three children under 10 in a full-time job and came to Oklahoma City. Why did he pick Oklahoma City or Oklahoma? I'm not for sure, but I think it has something to do with there being a need for civil engineers, which is what my dad was, and maybe something to do with Oklahoma Ag now known as OSU, because he ultimately, uh, over the next two years, he got two things. One was his master's degree in engineering from Oklahoma Ag, but he got his permanent residency status. And so my dad was gone on the other side of the world when I was two, and then when I was four, the rest of the family were able to move to Oklahoma City because he got his permanent residency status. And within six months, I think, for sure a year, but probably six months, we moved into 
the Senate district that I now represent. And my mother ended up working at the Medical Research Foundation uh, as a lab technician for 25 plus years. My dad was a structural bridge designer for this, the DO, Oklahoma DOT and worked there for 25 plus years. But uh, why did I mention all that? What was I gonna say? Oh, so uh, anyway, I'm a lucky guy, okay. So my parents took blood pressure, high blood pressure medicine, okay, all right. My dad took it really his entire adult life. When I was 29, when I was 29, I'm 61 now, when I was 29, my blood pressure was borderline, okay? I knew I was gonna have to take blood pressure medicine. So when I was 29, I started exercising regularly every other day, which I'd never exercised regularly prior to that. So I went to the health club, there's a club here in town called International Fitness. And if you bought two years, you get two years free. Well, unfortunately, they went bankrupt after three years, so I only got one free year. But, but anyway, they had a, a, a cardiovascular workout that got your heart rate up and kept it up. And so I started doing that, and within two to three months, my blood pressure came down to normal. And I lost two inches on my waist, gained an inch on my chest, gained three quarters of an inch on each bicep because they measured that kind of stuff back then. So. In eight years ago, I started taking blood pressure medicine again, or started for the first time, because my blood pressure had crept up over the years, okay, eight years ago. But so what does that mean? That means I postponed blood pressure medicine for 25 years. Okay, now, most of the listeners or viewers are not 29 years old, okay? So what can you do? Well, here's what you can do. Something I did not do is Eight years ago, when I started taking blood pressure medicine, I monitored my blood pressure and it came down on the medicine, okay? But also, eight years ago, I started exercising every day. Why did I do that? Because I read an Institute of Medicine study that came out about 10 years ago that said all Americans should exercise every day anywhere from 30 to 90 minutes every day. Closer to 90 minutes if you've lost a lot of weight and you're trying to keep it off, or if you're trying to lose a lot of weight, okay? So eight, eight years ago when I started the blood pressure medicine, I started exercising every day. I, st I still went to the health club every other day and did this kind of cardiovascular workout. Uh, but on my off days, what I try to do is bicycle, okay? But I'm a fair weather biker. If it's too cold, too hot, or too windy, I do like a stair machine or, or, a, or a stationary bicycle. My, my wife bought me an ancient Schwinn Aerodyne for $25 at an estate sale, works perfectly. But, so that, that's what I do. Okay, but what I did not do eight years ago was I did not quit taking my blood pressure medicine to see if this exercising every day made a difference. Well, about a month ago, I quit taking my blood pressure medicine to see what my blood pressure would do. And you know what? My blood pressure's fine. So that's what you, you can do things like that to take care of yourself. I hate taking medicine, so I am ecstatic that I'm off of the lisinopril is what I took. And, and by the way, for those of you who don't know, lisinopril is, is uh, prescribed a lot for high blood pressure. It's a great medicine, it's been around for a long time, but it has one side effect that a lot of people have, including my wife and my mother had it. They couldn't take it. It causes a cough. And it's, a, it's kind of a, a dry cough that's kind of irritating because it's always there. You, you, yeah. But so yeah, if you have that and you're taking lisinopril, talk to your doctor, it's probably being caused by the lisinopril. So I now take nothing for blood pressure. So anyway, there are things you can do. And my mother, actually, before she died, for the last three or four years of her life, had some sort of dementia, okay? Uh, you know, was it Alzheimer's? Was it senile dementia? Well, we don't really know. But, so I'm probably at risk for that. So what can you do for that? Well, there's lots of articles, medical articles, that say there's two things you can do for dementia, okay? Two things. One is physical exercise. It helps. So if you're not doing a regular regimen of physical exercise, start doing it. And you don't need to go run a marathon. 
walking is just fine. Walking is just fine. And if you have access to swimming, swimming is great, especially if, if you have joint problems, okay? But a lot of people don't have access to swimming all year long. But my mother, I tried to get her to exercise. And she actually did a little bit of it for a while. Uh, but she kind of quit because she said she didn't like to sweat. Well, if you're going to exercise, you might have to sweat, okay? So, exercising helps with dementia, okay? Now, they're working real hard on treatments for dementia. And in fact, at, at the OU Medical Center, that, that they're working real hard. There used to be a guy named Jordan Tang that's been working on research for that. Although I think maybe he's, uh, he's retired. Uh, but okay, what else can you do besides physical exercise? You can actually use your brain differently, okay? Take up something new. If you've never played bridge, start playing bridge. If you've never done crossword puzzles, do crossword puzzles. Or if you're my age, maybe uh, become a state senator. Because believe me, that's a lot different from being a doctor. A lot different. <laughs> All right, so let's see. What else can I talk about? Any, any questions about what I've just been talking about? So be proactive in your health. But, but also, as you get older, of course, you need to be careful, you know. I mean, like, I worry, I, I have a two-story house, and I worry about going up and down the stairs, you know. I, I, you know, just flying up the stairs like I, you know, have always done, you know. Well, as you get older, you might think twice about that, you know, kind of, because, you know, you, you break your a leg or something, break your hip, boy, it's going to be bad news. So you, so you do need to be careful. But again, as far as exercise is concerned, walking is just fine, just fine. One hour, wow, cool. More, surely, surely there's more questions. Ask me anything. It doesn't have to do with health care. It can be about being a crazy state senator, which it is a little crazy. I mean. Well, okay. Well, it's a pleasure doing this, and maybe we can do this again sometime. I'm happy to help out. Thank you all for watching. Thank you, Senator Yen. We appreciate you coming today to talk about immunizations and general health tips for seniors. Absolutely. Please remember we offer a number of classes for free uh, through OHI, uh, www.ohai.org, some of which deal with healthy eating and exercise and low impact exercise. Uh, some of our exercise classes are modified for people who may be in a wheelchair uh, or for people with limited mobility. So there's a lot of possibilities for you to be proactive about your health. And if you'd like to pick up the phone, which seems to be a lost art nowadays, you can call us at 405-271-2290 uh, and we will try and connect you with a class or uh, an opportunity in your area. Uh, thank you for attending today's video conference and we hope you enjoy the rest of your day.